Hi everybody, this is Dr. Narda Robinson and I'm here with CuraCore Academy Talks. And today's topic will be medial shoulder syndrome. Something I call a wastebasket diagnosis, why is that? What is a wastebasket diagnosis? It's an imprecise diagnosis that describes disputed medical conditions, suggesting that the condition has more heterogeneity than other more clearly defined clinical entities. Examples from human medicine include chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, I have chronic fatigue. When it hasn't been diagnosed. Fibromyalgia, when applied to undiagnosed pain. And costochondritis, uh, oh, it must be costochondritis, when applied to undiagnosed chest pain. So there have been a number of these over the years, candidiasis, Epstein-Barr, all these things. And unless it actually is that, then it's just tiring to see people put these just into this lumped category. But even more so, I find that medial shoulder syndrome is irritating to me in the veterinary world. So what is medial shoulder syndrome? Well, according to Millis and Levine in their book, Canine Rehabilitation and Physical Therapy, I'll have a number of quotes from them. They say, it is one of the most common causes of forelimb gait-related lamenesses in performance dogs, and that this condition may be considered somewhat similar to rotator cuff injuries in people. We'll get back to that. And also that in dogs with medial shoulder instability, or MSI, it's a further progression of the syndrome, Lameness may be as subtle as performance-related problems, such as refusing tight turns, or as severe as a weight-bearing lameness. So what bothers me here? Well, it can be like this whole range of things. Oh, you know, missing a beat there in the agility trial, whatever, or not bearing any weight. Well, that doesn't tell me much of anything. That's like with the cruciate issues. Oh, maybe they can't jump into cars. Maybe they're less active. It can be anything. So that is irritating to me. Um, the anatomy of medial shoulder syndrome and medial shoulder instability. Now, this is a human diagram on the right because I didn't have a good um, stock photo for medial shoulder anatomy in the dog. But they describe, you know, when we get to the anatomy, okay, there are still limitations, though, and that's what this talk is about. Okay, the joint capsule, ligaments, and surrounding muscles and tendons all contribute to the stability of the shoulder. Okay, all, everything is important. Okay, insult or injury to any portion of the capsulo ligamentous support structures can potentially cause shoulder joint pathology resulting in pain and dysfunction. Okay, that's getting a little nebulous. So we're blaming the medial shoulder. So on the right here, um, the the scapula on the left, so this one, is looking at it from your back's perspective. It's like your, your back is looking back at your scapula, and this is what it sees. So this is your subscapularis muscle. Um, and on the back side, if someone is looking at your back, this is the, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus muscles. And so there, you know, there are gamishes of little tendinous attachments because essentially what happens is, here's my doggy. Um, that the, the shoulder, your arm, is kind of plopped onto your body and the junction it makes, it's not a real joint, it's called a synsarcosis. So syn, S-Y-N, um, a joining of sarcosis of muscles and, and other little tissues and stuff. So it, it gamishes on there um, and you know connects over the back, but there's not a lot of strength to that joint. There's a lot of mobility, but there's not a lot of strength. And so, you know, just the anatomy of this, okay, well, it's stuff on this inner surface in here and could be muscle, could be joint capsule, could be ligamentous, could be some of the bone. You know, it's very vague, but I get that they're targeting the medial shoulder syndrome. My contention is that the whole anatomy matters, at least all of the muscular anatomy of the shoulder, but also just everything because if you're studying in our Cura Corvette Integrative Rehab and Physical Medicine program, then you'll know that fascia is a big focus of what we do and how everything connects to everything. And just think simply, if a dog had hip problems or lumbosacral problems, whatever it was, and they're moving their uh, weight forward, that is not the, the tendon's fault in your shoulder. That is not the ligament's fault. 
That is because you're stressing from elsewhere. So what's really the primary problem? And they continue, all these quotes are from the book. The components that are most commonly affected by medial shoulder syndrome and instability include the craniomedial joint capsule, medial glenohumeral ligament, subscapularis tendon, supraspinatus tendon, labrum, that, that lip of the, the bone there and at the joint, and less commonly, the biceps tendon. Okay, we've seen some of those. Currently, the exact cause is unknown. Wastebasket, wastebasket. Although it is suspected to be related to chronic repetitive activity or overuse rather than trauma. Okay, so we're talking about dogs that do a lot of athletic performance. We know that they are at risk for this, especially if they do things like weave pulls, that they're going to weaken that joint structure. Again, it's not the little structures at the joint that's the problem. It's possibly like why is that person making this dog do something their body was not designed for? I know border collies have a lot of energy. I know they're great at it. I know, isn't it beautiful to watch? Well, you know, not to me. Um, they're stressing their joints. They'll do it because they love it and there's a lot of excitement. Is that the right thing to do? But if you know that this is a problem with these dogs in this condition that we're putting them in, in an artificial kind of situation and asking them to do things, that yeah, they can do great at for a while and then there are problems. Why are we doing that in the first place? And why aren't we addressing this? Why aren't you even changing the freaking sport so it doesn't happen? Anyway, repetitive activities such as jump turn combinations and weave poles performed regularly during practice and at weekend trials place the shoulder near its end range of abduction and stress the soft tissues of the medial shoulder complex. Okay. We know where it's going to happen. We know why it's going to happen. We kind of can predict when after a bit. And so, like, what, what, are you, what are you continuing to do this for? Oh, because they love it. They're so pretty. Oh, look, aren't they great? Clinical signs. Presenting complaints and clinical signs in dogs with syndrome can vary from subtle, such as missing cues or refusing tight turns during performance, to an overt intermittent unilateral lameness. Again, the wastebasket piece is, I get that you're focusing on that inside of the joint, but there are a whole bunch of other things that can lead to this. And maybe ultimately that is where it's gonna stress out and break down. Um, but then here, look at this. It is not uncommon for the history to include identification of restrictions, spasm, and trigger points, ding, ding, or mild atrophy in the affected shoulder by a therapist, veterinary rehab therapist, veterinary massage therapist, or veterinary chiropractor. Um, how about acupuncturist? Where is acupuncture in there? Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. And we'll get back to that later. But, um, you know, I get if you have a problem with acupuncture because you've seen people talk about chi this and chi that and damp spleens and wind in my shoulder and, you know, yang rising to my head. I get that. But that's not what all acupuncture is about. Kira Corvette, we teach medical acupuncture. It's all scientific. So to not include acupuncture in the appropriate places in this book and elsewhere, I think is a real disservice. We'll get back to that. Anyway, so they're even admitting that there is myofascial precedent to this problem. So why aren't we focusing on the myofascial treatment and even especially on the myofascial palpation? And if you don't know myofascial palpation, this is a lot about what we teach at Kira Corvette. And it's not feeling, get this right now, it's not feeling along the axes, uh, along the longitudinal directions of muscles. We're not going through the just, I mean, if you want to do a rolfing S thing, that's fine. Go through the myofascial cleavage planes, but it's about cross fiber palpation. You're not going to get much information if you're following the flow. Oh, I don't feel anything. Oh, seems okay. Dog doesn't have myofascial dysfunction. Wrong. You have to palpate perpendicular to the direction of the muscle fibers, which means you need to know enough about anatomy to know the direction of the muscle fibers, or at least feel the freaking stuff. Feel that the muscles are going this way and go perpendicular. We'll get back to anatomy later. 
but everybody should be doing a myofascial palpation exam and you find stuff and you treat it and then you go on. Dogs with chronic conditions typically have a history of poor response to rest and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and increased lameness after exercise and heavy activities. Ding, ding, don't do all that heavy activity. Okay, orthopedic exam. This is an interesting thing. Mildly shortened stride to weight-bearing lameness. Okay, it could be this. It could be a lot of other things. Atrophy. Could be this. Could be other things. Restricted range of motion and shoulder extension. Got it. The most consistent physical finding in dogs with the syndrome are shoulder spasm and discomfort on abduction of the affected shoulder. Yes, and there could be other things as well. So then there's the shoulder abduction test. You hold down their shoulder and then you bring up their little arm. And, you know, they don't necessarily like it. They could be laying down. I'll show you a video of Deanna Rogers, our physical therapist that helps teach with the rehab course. Uh, but you can also do it standing up. But, you know, that's very limited. It's, it's very... To me, um, I mean, yeah, if you're getting excessive amounts of movement, yes, yeah, something might be torn. Why are we waiting until that degree of problem? Okay, some people do. That's, that's what that is. But, uh, you know, there are ways to prevent it from getting that bad, if this is what it is. So, anyway... Um, yeah, if they've torn a bunch of stuff, then they're going to move too much. So treatment for it, stabilization exercises, as, as listed in, in Millis and Levine's book. Stabilization exercises, yes, balance board, lifting of opposite thoracic and pelvic limb, weight shifts, scapular stabilization work on a disc, yes. You can do all that, tighten those muscles, get the muscles firing that aren't firing. Um, you avoid especially, you know, if you're going to stretch, that's fine, but don't be making them go in the direction that is the problem. And then again, as they list, they have laser therapy, cold and heat, thermal approaches, neuromuscular electrical stimulation for atrophy, targeting the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. I would argue you have to really examine all the muscles and see what needs it. Treat the teres major for shortening and tenderness to palpation. I would argue you need to palpate and treat all the muscles that are involved. Um, and then they mention laser therapy, massage, but no, not acupuncture. Okay, I got it. You don't, you don't even know what acupuncture really is, is my impression, at least when they wrote this book. Uh, or maybe they do and they just don't like the whole... Um, you know, neuromodulation and myofascial dysfunction. Who knows? Uh, they go on underwater treadmill as an approach. Keep the water height above the elbow to reduce stress on the elbow. Um, anticipate two to eight weeks recovery time and change the activity. That's nice. And so, yeah, or, or you can do surgery if it doesn't uh, work and, and do these other things. Well, ick. I'm not even going to cover those in this talk. You can look that up. What's the prevailing sentiment here? Just, you know, this is from World Small Animal Veterinary Association, World Congress Proceedings. It was off of VIN. So um, I just thought this is, a, this is a kind of general assessment, general impression that you read over and over again for shoulder instability, tips to diagnosis, and methods of treatment. Uh, Beale says, like the others, frequently diagnosed, thought to be a common cause, of shoulder pain and lameness um, allows movement of the humeral head in relation to the glenoid cavity due to disruption of soft tissue supportive structures. Okay, ding, ding. Let's focus on those soft tissue structures. And that's what some of those rehab approaches were about, yes. Uh, but we can also tune things up, tune up the firing with acupuncture and related techniques. We can reduce nociceptor activation, which would be inhibitory. Uh, so nociceptors are inhibitory to motor control. So we want to have pain control. And they say diagnosis of the condition can be difficult and controversial. Yes. Which structures warrant exploration? Well, we will go into that um, at the end of the talk. So here, here is Deanna Rogers and Abbott. Abbott. Um, Here's Abbott um, missing his right forelimb, and he, it was hard to get him to, it was, here's Abbott, it was hard to get him to lie on his right side, um, but eventually Deanna did, 
and um, this is in one of our um, just examination and treatment sessions with Abbott and so she's going to be showing this is just some of her range of motion testing with him and um, and and soft tissue assessment and then she's going to be doing the abduction test and it's kind of hard to see it's be it's in the back of her forearm but it doesn't it doesn't move much and so about 30 degrees is the um, the normal approach yeah uh, and so integrative rehab and physical medicine principle group one so here here is like my approach to this evaluate the entire shoulder region including all of the muscles and fascia the medial shoulder structures comprise the victims not the perpetrators of the problem perpetrators coming from like what are you asking this poor animal to do all the time but also what is the whole gamish what is the whole context of the shoulder region, the opposite thoracic limb, and elsewhere. Okay, number two, perform a thorough myofascial palpation exam. You may need to review the anatomy. We have that at the end of the talk and in a downloadable handout. Cross fiber palpation, not longitudinal, and evaluate all the muscles and movers of the shoulder bilaterally. You should at least do that, but really a full myofascial exam. Consider contributions from the caudal body regions, as I've said. Principle group three, Remain mindful of the influence of fascial expansions and myofascial chains on the distribution of mechanical force. So when we talk about our fascia in our fascia modules, remember it's not just connective tissue, it's not just packing material. It has the capacity to diffuse and just spread out forces that are on, for example, the limb. But if you have a lot of tightness and restriction, that force is not going to transfer to other places as well. So we need to treat that as well. Principle group four, nociception impairs efferent motor output pathways. It also impairs afferent proprioceptive pathways. Chronic nociception induced motor inhibition might prevent effective motor retraining. All these are important. Remember, we've talked elsewhere and in our courses, we teach the sensory motor integration for joint integrity and just proper body movement, efficient function, and then also autonomically, nociception induced sympathetically maintained vasoconstriction reduces blood flow for working muscles. And FYI, nerves, nerves do not like impaired blood flow. So we have to make sure that circulation is in order. Otherwise, it leads to muscle hypoxia, oxidative stress, and increased muscle nociception. Principle group four continued, amplification of tonic sympathetic nervous system activity depresses the sensitivity of proprioceptors such as muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. Therefore, you don't know so much where your limbs are in space, you are more prone to injury, and your brain cannot guide the direction and the stiffness and, and muscle tension, the quality of movement. Uh, in your periphery and so you have problems motor control and coordination thereby deteriorate principle group five find it fix it let it heal meaning do dogs really need to run through weave poles i know that's controversial i don't care so here's a paper from veterinary evidence this is a uk publication there is no superior treatment method for medial shoulder instability in dogs their question I started with what treatment option results in the best patient outcomes, medical or surgical management. So keep this in mind, especially if you're a vet student and you are um, hearing, you know, you're in orthopedic surgery class and you're hearing about all these surgeries and all oh, gold standard and get them in right away. Yeah, look up the evidence and see how strong that is. I think maybe your surgeons won't tell you. Uh, so you got to look it up yourself. So 10 papers were critically reviewed. One was prospective, but re performed on research dogs that were killed to evaluate the outcome of the surgery. And the remaining nine, there were retrospectives and all that stuff. Outcomes reported, um, surgery and medical treatment of medial shoulder instability can be successful. Doesn't mean it's the ideal thing, but there is no strong evidence to support one surgical treatment over another. Conclusion. Dogs diagnosed with medial shoulder instability may be treated successfully with either medical or surgical management.
Then they talk about, oh yeah, young border collie, participates in agility, comes to you for poor performance. So here's the clinical scenario you find yourself in. Um, yeah, there's pain in the shoulder manipulation. What do you do? And then we just found out um, it doesn't really matter. And uh, medical or surgical will work. So evidence continued. Oftentimes, information is not fully reported and all cases are treated the same. Some reports may even include traumatic and congenital luxation. So we don't really know the ideal surgical candidate, but I mean, probably yeah, if their limb is flopping in the breeze, probably. But why are we waiting until that point? So we don't have any systematic reviews or meta-analyses for this condition. And so the evidence isn't that great. But remember, we talked about that this is, has been likened to rotator cuff injuries in humans because some of the same structures are involved. So what about the evidence there? Again, UK, 2021, British Medical Journal. They have, this is the title, Common Elective Orthopedic Procedures and Their Clinical Effectiveness, an Umbrella Review of Level 1 Evidence. Here they talk about 10 of the most common elective orthopedic procedures including arthroscopic, anterior, cruciate ligament reconstruction, and others, I won't read them here, but also arthroscopic, rotator cuff repair, and so on and so forth. Randomized controlled trial evidence supports the superiority of carpal tunnel syndrome decompression, especially if that's really it, cramping on the nerves, you can just cut that, let the nerve breathe, and total knee replacement over non-operative care. Um, trial evidence for the other six procedures showed no benefit over non-operative care. Isn't that interesting? Although they may be effective overall or in certain subgroups, no strong high quality evidence base shows that many common, commonly performed elective orthopedic procedures are more effective than non-operative alternative. Hmm. How about this one from Cochrane Library, database of systematic reviews, surgery for rotator cuff tears. Conclusions. At the moment, we are uncertain whether rotator cuff repair surgery provides clinically meaningful benefits to people with symptomatic tears. It may provide little or no clinically important benefits with respect to pain, function, overall quality of life, or participant-related global assessment of treatment success when compared with non-operative treatment. Surgery may not improve shoulder pain or function compared with exercises with or without steroid injections. And um, so, okay, that's nice to know. Here, another one from Cochrane Library. Electrotherapy modalities for rotator cuff disease. It's a review. Based on low quality evidence, therapeutic ultrasound may have short-term benefits over placebo in people with galcific tendonitis and low-level laser therapy may have short-term benefits over placebo in people with rotator cuff disease. Good to know. We're uncertain whether TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, is superior to placebo and whether any electrotherapy modality provides benefits over other active in interventions such as steroid injection because of the very low quality evidence. How about dry needling? Current reviews in musculoskeletal medicine 2020. Dry needling as a treatment modality for tendinopathy, a narrative review. Tendinopathy describes a combination of pain, swelling, and impaired performance of the tendon and around in surrounding structures. Various treatment options exist. Dry needling involves inserting needles into the affected tendon, and it is thought to disrupt the chronic degenerative process and encourage localized bleeding and fibroblastic proliferation. The purpose of this review is to review the use of dry needling as a treatment modality for tendinopathy. And including for rotator cuff problems. Most systematic reviews and randomized controlled trials support the effectiveness of tendon needling. Hey guys, you people that weren't wanting to talk about acupuncture in your book, notice this. Current research provides initial support for the efficacy of dry needling for tendinopathy treatment. It seems that tendon needling is minimally invasive, safe, and inexpensive, carries a low risk, and represents a promising area of future research. Wouldn't you rather do that than just plow in with a scalpel? I mean, if you're the patient, maybe not the surgeon. How about shockwave therapy? It's kind of the rage in a lot of veterinary medicine. For rotator cuff disease with or without calcification. Well, 
based upon the currently available low to moderate certainty evidence in humans, there were very few clinically important benefits of shockwave therapy and uncertainty regarding its therapy. Wide clinical diversity and varying treatment protocols means that we do not know whether or not some trials tested subtherapeutic doses, possibly underestimating their possible benefits. So yeah, now back to what we should be doing. So just to take a, a look, medial shoulder syndrome is a very imprecise diagnosis. I mean, yeah, if there's a lot of laxity, you can see that, that may, may mean it's instability. and then what do you do about it from there? Well, I would try non-invasive first. There's lots of things you can do from an integrative rehabilitation perspective and physical medicine, and you can give the dog some supportive stabilization when they walk, and that would be good. But there are so many muscles that are not being addressed. You can't just focus on the victims. You need to look at the perpetrators. So remember, we have agonists and antagonists. So what is the muscle balance? What is that dynamic stability that is being not provided because of different muscle um, firing patterns than should be what they are? And is that because there is pain? And how do we treat that? Well, how do we find it? We have to find it with our palpation. So here's a review of some of our anatomy plates that we um, had our medical illustrator create for CuraCore. And I've colored in um, a, a color consistently for a muscle as it appears in different places. So in pink, you have the rhomboids, different parts of the rhomboids. And then you have in yellow, the supraspinatus, and in lime green, the infraspinatus. You need to palpate those, those are deep. And on a more superficial level, we have our brachiocephalicus. We have the supraspinatus there in yellow. So brachiocephalicus muscle in pink. Uh, trapezius in light blue, deltoid muscle in green, and then latissimus dorsi coming down to insert on the thoracolumbar fascia in purple. Taking a side view, we again have the trapezius in blue, we have the latissimus dorsi, the deltoid here in green with a little bit of infraspinatus in lime green, and brachiocephalicus in deep pink, and the deep pectorals in, in orange, and then the triceps. I tried to keep this focusing on the long head because it's the long head that reaches the shoulder, the others don't. Um, but all these muscles, and you see what's happening here, we have dorsal, we have lateral, we have ventral. There are muscles all around the body. If we think of fascia, then is, if there's gonna be an impact when the paw hits the ground or whenever, whatever they're doing, and we pull all that, um, then the force gets transmitted if there is good fascial continuity and ability to receive and dissipate those forces. And then we have stabilization from the other side. We have connection between one side and the other. So all these muscles are important, including the, the pectorals. The pectorals are going to bring the thoracic limbs inward. And so all these muscles, just as with the cruciate, they need to help stabilize the joint and if they're not doing their part they need help and but they need to be examined here is the deep layer the dark purple is uh, serratus um, ventralis and the pink there is the rhomboid um, you see the yellow is supraspinatus and again the the lime green infraspinatus and deltoid here with a little bit of biceps brachii um, down here, the darker turquoise um, are deep pectorals. And so it's not just what's on the surface, but you can try to get deeper and understand what is, what is imbalanced, what is underfiring, what is overfiring, what is chronically restricted. Here is the cranial view. The deep pink is brachiocephalicus. The trapezius coming over the back um, is uh, in blue. And then that, that Green here is deltoid, and then the biceps, and then the big orange pectoral region. So the solution, it's not about designing more creative or invasive surgeries, or let's pile on everything that we do in rehab, PEMF, so pulse electromagnetic field therapy, the shock wave, the, the everything, and just pummeling all this stuff on them, or piling on more integrative medicine procedures as much as we love them and we like to do them. But your first step 
is to do an astute and anatomically informed palpation, and that's what our handout, that's what these anatomy plates are I just shown you. Get used to doing a better diagnosis through your hands. If you can't identify the problem, you can't implement a clear and effective solution. Okay, got it? Goes for everything. If you want to learn more about our rehab program and our certification in integrative rehabilitation and physical medicine, we do have this course, we call it MOVE, and is 177 race approved continuing education hours. If you have questions, you can email me. If you want the handout and you can't find it elsewhere, contact info at curacore.org. Okay, thanks. There's our website. Thanks for joining us again this month. See you again soon.